Thank you. Thank you, Lauren and Hannah, for this uh, invitation. I'm very happy to be here, even if only virtually. Um, and uh, today I'm going to speak about a work in progress, which comes from uh, our ESRC funded project that I provisionally entitled this paper, The Automated Gate Let Me Go Out, But I Feel in Prison, Rethinking Control Over Refugees Through and Beyond Technological Disruption. So I'm gonna share at some point some like images that just to give you an idea of where camps, refugee camps are located in Greece, but I don't have a PowerPoint. So in 2020, the European Commission founded closed refugee camps on the Greek island of Samos, Laros, Kos, Lesbos and Chios, where the so-called hotspots are located. These sites of migration containment, these new camps have been presented as high tax camps, as model camps that will make possible to keep track of refugees and at the same time to make refugees safer. So it's interesting to uh, I mean, bear in mind this uh, ambivalent discourse. When the closed camp in Samos was inaugurated in September 2021, it was promoted by both European and Greek authorities as a model camp to replicate elsewhere, both in Greece and, uh, and elsewhere in Europe. The EU-funded projects have been object of criticism and on the part of journalists, NGOs, and human rights organizations, which pointed to the risk of enhanced and pervasive surveillance exercise on refugees. In particular, surveillance would be enacted through cameras installed in the camp and through automated gates at the main entry, where people who live inside would have to sweep their car, their, their saloon card and put their fingerprint to, get, to go in and out. If I, I mean, if I'm allowed to share, let's see, uh, if Zoom allowed me just to share this, okay, just to give you an idea of these gates, right? See, these are the gates that have been installed in some of the camps in Greece, in Samos, but also on the mainland uh, in the camp of Malakaza and uh, Rizona, even uh, only in, in Malakaza and Samos are currently working. You see, these are like automated turnstiles and refugees need to swipe their card in Greece. There is this digital asylum card since last year. And they also need to put their fingerprint uh, in order to enter and as well as to uh, go out. So these, these, uh, these uh, gates have been object of criticism. Um, and for instance, um, EDRI, uh, as, uh, the organization EDRI has contended that, uh, I quote, this fits a broader trend of the EU pouring public money into dystopian and experimental civilian project, which treat human beings as lab rats. However, this is what I would like to discuss with you today. What does it happen behind and beyond the automated turnstile? Indeed, it seems to me that an, an almost exclusive focus on high tech and automated controls in camps has contributed to sideline the critique of bordering mechanism and, the, and of the carceral modes, right? That are implemented in the camps in Greece, but also elsewhere beyond, even beyond official detention sites. And, uh, and also when uh, carceral mechanisms do not consist in immobilizing people, because as I will explain, in fact, this is not the case uh, in Greece. So I think that these like kind of uh, criticism of uh, carceral mechanisms have been sidelined to the advantage of criticism centered on bias, surveillance, discrimination, and data privacy. And the fact that uh, we tend to uh, conceive conceptualize control in terms of surveillance and discrimination, it shouldn't go without saying, right? I think that there is this um, escalating trend of uh, conflating control and surveillance and, and, and also uh, in a, a re, I mean, I, articulating a critique of, the, of, of borders in terms of uh, its discriminatory functioning, but it's a very specific way. Uh, of understanding control uh, uh, over lives, right? Um, that uh, ends up in like overshadowing heterogeneous modes of like choking refugee lives. So of course, this doesn't mean like warning about this, dismissing the risk associated to the implementation of AI and algorithmic driven systems in camps and in the asylum system at large. Rather, the point is to question the extent to which exclusive attention to so-called techno-humanitarianism lead us to circumscribe our understanding of control over refugee lives in terms of tracking and monitoring. And jointly push us to craft critique of migration containment and humanitarian control, as I said, through the lenses of discrimination and surveillance only. 
Relatedly, the exclusive focus on the high tech and preoccupation for surveillance and discrimination, then the factor enforces ways of seeing migration like a state. By taking for granted that, um, that what matters is precisely the implementation of this technology, but also taking for granted that this technology work, or at least that they work in the same way that they have been planned for. Um, so for me, uh, both, I mean, that what I would like indeed uh, to be out of conversation in this hour is precisely, uh, I mean, the, the, the kind of like slippery terrain, right? Of um, reproposing in our research, but also in intervention. Uh, I mean, for those of you who are like a practitioner and have a lot of experience on the ground, um, of going and seeing precisely what the European Commission or uh, policymakers uh, suggest us, right, indirectly to look at. Uh, and also, if we want to look at these gates, right, that I think, I mean, we can, I'm happy to expand on how they work, which kind of data is extracted and how this is shared. Um, uh, but uh, the point is, what do we want to, in to investigate, right? Uh, so I think that it's key to ask how and in which form is control exercised on refugees, on refugee lives beyond tracking, and how to rethink the critique of refugee carcerality in light of the implementation of technology, because of course they uh, uh, contributed to transform the way in which carceral mechanisms are enacted, and this is what I will discuss, and to what extent an exclusive focus on technology overshadow a critique of bordering mechanisms. So in this respect, anthropologist Barbara Pinelli has contended that, I quote, an attentive gaze cannot limit itself to interpreting the most obvious forms of control and surveillance. In the first place, it is necessary to delve beneath the ostensible freedom and concessions, as well as the imaginaries of humanitarian regimes to understand how this also operates in a way that is not only ambiguous and ambivalent, but also violent in its own right. So I'm drawing on this, right? I think it's a very important reminder not to conceive control uh, also by looking at, not to understand control also by looking at its most obvious form. <clears throat> and why I think that Greece from this point of view represent a case in point, um, I mean, as probably you know, Greece has been uh, considered, I mean, has been considered a sort of laboratory, right, of uh, European migration policies. I'm quite, I mean, uh, skeptical about this use of the term laboratory because it reproposed the, the idea of this kind of like ide ideal uh, closed space where the European Union or external uh, actors can come in and test, right? But to some extent has been a sort of bad test of um, for, for implementing uh, not only technologies, but also um, administrative practices at the edge of, European law and international law, right? And to systematize this latter as a way of governing uh, uh, refugees. Um, and at the same time, I think that is, uh, Greek, the Greek refugee context is quite interesting precisely because uh, Greek authorities are not interested in keeping track of refugees. And it's important to read, to, to analyze the implementation of this technology in light of the silent or in some cases also less silent battle between Greece and the European Commission. When of course, of course, on the one hand, Greece is extremely dependent on EU funds, much more than Italy, for instance, and is still much, much more dependent. But on the other, of course, the, the other side of, of the story is that, uh, I mean, so Greece receive all these technologies, right, uh, to installing camps and money. But then there is a matter of who manage uh, the presence of the refugees. And so in particular, um, uh, what I'm referring to in this moment is the, um, is the increasing presence of people whose asylum application has been denied, in particular due to uh, a law that established um, that Turkey is a safe country, right? So migrants coming from Bangladesh, Somalia, um, Syria, Pakistan, and Afghanistan uh, can be considered non-eligible uh, for the asylum uh, uh, procedure. So it's very discretionary, right? And uh, if you look at the statistics this year, the number of Somali is like around 90, 80% have been preventively denied, right? So there is this increased number of preventively rejected asylum seekers uh, whose presence is becoming a problem, in particular on the island. 
um, so that because of course they don't know what to do with these people, right? Uh, and so uh, Greece resorted to also more informal way of dealing with this uh, unwanted presence that is in part the result of European policies or anyway of the European Union pushing, putting pressure on Greece um, to uh, illegalize people, right? Um, and so resorting to, to in, in informal practices such as, for instance, allowing them to move to the mainland with a stamp, right? Uh, and then to remain illegally in Greece or to try to make their own way to Italy or along the Balkan. So um, important surveillance and control are not exercised only through physical restriction and coercion, nor are they narrowed to tracking and monitoring at a distance. In, in fact, surveillance and control are enforced through a mix of disciplinary moral rules, administrative or material hurdles for accessing rights and to choke migrants' autonomous spaces of livability. And I will um, I mean I will come back to this point that for me is very important. Um, second, uh, I think is important uh, is key to understand, however, how the presence of this technology, disregarding whether or not they work, because many of these technologies are there, but they are not fully implemented, so they just don't work, contribute to a perception of unsafety among refugees. Uh, who have the feeling that they are in a sort of prison, but not in the sense of being in a panopticon necessarily, not in the sense of being uh, immobilized inside the camp, because in most of the camp, by now, many mobility restrictions that were in place during COVID-19 and after that have been lifted, but in the sense of, and this is connected to what I just said, to the impossibility of building an autonomous life, right? In the camp and outside the camp. So as long as they try to, uh, have to not to be dependent on uh, humanitarian actors, uh, they are immediately uh, like criminalized. For instance, uh, in Lesbos, in many cases, they're not allowed to bring into the camp uh, objects that might, might be considered dangerous, but also in some cases, food and they are not allowed to cook their own food, right? Um, however, the paradox is that uh, they cannot be fully dependent on humanitarian actors because there is this minimal biopolitics at stake, right? So what they receive at the moment from uh, state authorities uh, is very minimal and in some cases is not sufficient at all. So they are, they are kept in the state of protracted dependency and not allowed to have like an autonomous choice and uh, uh, collective spaces, uh, and but they cannot rely, right, uh, on, uh, on uh, aid, humanitarian aid or medical aid as such, because simply because it's not provided enough, right? Um, so as you probably know, of course, this is like a part like of the my European migration narrative is quite well known that since 2015 with the start of what the European member states define as a refugee crisis. Green, Greece has been in the spotlight due to the arrival of Syrian escapees, then the opening of the hotspot and the start of the so-called hotspot approach in Italy and in Greece. They contested the EU-Turkey deal signed in March 2016, um, and a series right, of like measures that since then have been implemented to um, hamper migrants from getting access not only to international protection, but to the asylum procedure as such. Um, so I think that um, the EU's plan to build close control camps in Greece, because it actually is a plan, right? Because only in Samos, this has been um, in inaugurated in Laros and in Kos is about to be, and in, in Lesbos is under construction. The current camp in Lesbos is still the, with the old one, the one that uh, has been open after the fire in Moria, uh, where there is no uh, technology at all, right? No automated gate. Uh, like very old style police control. Uh, anyway, this plan should be situated in this broader EU driven political economy of refugee encampment in Greece, right? So there is this tendency to um, uh, keep refugees in camps. And in this, re in this respect, I want to just to pro show you quickly uh, uh, the map of like where camps are located because in the end is the only, is quite remarkable that Greece is the only European country uh, with Croatia to some extent, but are different kinds of camps where there are refugee camps. In Italy, there, for instance, there are no refugee camps. In France, there are no uh, 
refugee camps, right? And this uh, in politics of encampment is really um, uh, at the core of the, the European plan for Greece. Um, so uh, I, 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 there are, of course, many uh, angles from which we can criticize this technology. One is, again, the risk of like surveillance. Uh, the other one that uh, some uh, both academics and journalists and uh, human rights organizations have raised is that this technology fail, right? Do not work. There are glitches, right? And however, these glitches, I think, uh, are not just, um, I mean, uh, side effects. Um, uh, I, what for me, what is important to notice is that this technology reinforce carceral mechanisms in the sense that they um, strengthen. Um, and corroborates way of governing refugees through unevenness and discretionary power. So it's precisely because they don't work. They, far from streamlining the system, uh, they work yes and no, sometimes don't work at all, sometimes work and suddenly stop working, or, the or there is a, uh, I mean, a, a, a shortage, right, in, a, in a supply chains or uh, there are there are no there is not enough personnel for making them work series of things that make makes all this technology very dysfunctional. And however, I think that this is uh, this is um, a constitutive of the way in which refugees in Greece and not only in Greece are uh, governed by producing this sense of unsafety and uncertainty, right? That shape a certain perception of carcerality that is not necessarily related to uh, spatial immobilization. Uh, and this for me is very important because it is um, it also um, raised the question of what does it mean to elaborate a critique of carcerality when refugees are in a state of semi-detention because of course they are not fully free to go out. There are still curfews in many camps Many people in a very arbitrary way are not allowed to go out even during the day. But even those who answer, yeah, I'm allowed, I mean, I, I can go in and out during the day, no problems. They must, many of them still feel this sense of like being in prison without being in a prison. Um, so it goes even beyond the special restriction. Um, and this kind of disruption, right? Technological disruption and glitches should be read also in light of uh, other technologies, much more basic, right? Uh, uh, that constantly fail or are not sufficient. Um, for instance, electricity inside the camp in Lesbos depends on 12 generators, and to date, only eight of them work. Glitches happen all the time, so the camp might remain without electricity. Plus, uh, in some cases, uh, in order to save money, after 9 p.m., uh, the, the, electricity, the electricity is switched off. So uh, in particular, this makes the camp even more unsafe for women, but not only, uh, who want to go, for instance, to, uh, to the toilet. Uh, on May 2022, women, men, and children who stayed in the refugee camp in Lesbos have, have remained with no electricity for about two weeks. And similar things happen in the camp of Samos, uh, where asylum seekers have been left also without running water in the famous high-tech camp, right? For about three weeks in spring 2022. So this might, looks like a paradox. We have these automated gates, um, not in Lesbos yet, but in Samos, um, but there is no, at some point, running water. There is not enough electricity, right? Um, so that, and as also camp man, the camp manager in Lesbos told me, this is how can you, how this, how can, can this technology be sustainable in a place where we don't, we don't have electricity? Um, but again, this uh, shortage happen according to this, like, so contribute, try right, to shape this sense of unsafety. And it, I think it's important to see this con continuity between the, the so called high tech and what is at least very basic infrastructure, uh, or if you want to call it low tech. Right. Um, so uh, with the outbreak of COVID-19, asylum seekers in Greece have been subjected to protracted mobility restriction and lockdowns. And these happen also in many other uh, countries uh, across Europe uh, in the name also of uh, what I call the principle of confined to protect. So um, people have been uh, kind of locked uh, in the hotspot or 
subjected to um, restriction, multiple restriction, um, uh, also mean enforced in a very arbitrary way in the name of their own protection against COVID-19, but also in the name of citizen protection from refugees who could be vehicle, right, of, I mean, of, of the virus. Um, so, and this restriction lasted uh, for a long period of time. Um, and as I said, now is, um, uh, I mean, there are still some in place, uh, but uh, most of them uh, have been lifted, right? Um, so, and, uh, and, and this, I mean, the, the way in which um, uh, refugees mobility is managed on the island is quite different from, from the mainland. Uh, because in the island there is the problem of uh, not ma making them visible, right? So there is this, this politics of, so the, the, the point of building these closed camps that however, the European commissioner, uh, Ilva Johansson clarified, these are not detention spaces. It's very interesting that she clarified this saying, we want to build uh, closed camp uh, close camps, close access camps, but these won't be detention spaces because they will, have, they will be allowed to go out and is the other thing, of course, that you cannot, uh, I mean, they, they, they formally, right, is not detention. So they play around this uh, the ambiguity of what is detention. But also the point is to bring everything inside. Uh, so uh, for this first time, there is a school inside the camp of Lesbos. So even if refugees are not, uh, I mean, formally, right, uh, forbidden from going out, the discourse is, well, you don't need to go out. You have everything inside. You have the school inside. Um, so to keep them apart, and in, may, and in particular, to make them even more invisible. So it is keeping them apart, which is quite different from just sealing them inside, right? As I said, it's not only a matter of uh, immobilizing them. Uh, also because, of course, there is this worry that uh, um, protests might happen. And these have been also the case, right? Um, so uh, this like setting apart uh, and, and and keeping them out of sight uh, has been uh, enforced also through this implementation of uh, technologies uh, and uh, that has been like mm, supported by this discourse, right? By this sort of like humanitarian uh, discourse. So. Um, on the mainland is a bit different uh, question because there is not there is not such an urgent need right of keeping them out of sight, but it's not a matter of coincidence that these camps are located so far away from uh, this, not only from Athens or or the main city, but even from villages, right? Um, so they, they, even if they're allowed to go out, they don't know where to go, right? And as the deputy director of Ritzona camp told me this summer, uh, they, I mean, uh, we just want to check if there are refugees who live for more days in a row, because in that, in that case, they are excluded, right, from the accommodation. And we need to control that only those who have the right to stay in the camp are inside. Indeed, there are many spontaneous arrival every week. So basically these gates are, these automated gates are uh, built uh, with the purpose of uh, preventing, in particular, people from getting inside more than refugees for going out. This, th those who live, those who live inside, of course, are subjected to a series of restrictions. That, however, they were subjected to even before the installation of these gates. Um, and as I said, is a very arbitrary when the police allows them to go out or not. Right. Uh, while the purpose is to monitor who comes in. And by spontaneous arrivals, he meant uh, people um, who try to, be, be, who don't have an accommodation, right? So uh, known Greek um, uh, uh, persons uh, who might be officially asylum seekers, but for some reason are excluded from the accommodation uh, system or uh, who didn't apply for, uh, uh, for asylum and who try to, get into the camp to, to, to sleep, right? Because they sublet, they might sublet, uh, give money, right? To, to people, to other refugees who were there uh, before uh, to pay for their containers or who might just stay with them, right? So it's a matter of like uh, monitoring who can, those who come uh, inside, right? Um, so, um, 
the automated turnstile have a set have been implemented in some camps like Malakas and Samos. In other, they have been installed but do not work. Um, however, more than affecting in a substantial way refugee movement, even if in some cases this is true, for instance, there is also a problem of people who have been registered, who have not, who didn't receive their asylum card yet and so cannot go out, right? Or on the island, uh, they still need to do the quarantine period after landing. And it might, uh, I mean, according to uh, a Greek um, uh, measure, uh, they can stay up to 25 days before being allowed to go out, right? So of course, there are these effects mobility, but not because of the automatic gates, right? Can be the same job can be done by policemen. And this is what happens in many camps in Greece and elsewhere. However, they announce the unevenness and arbitrariness of control, paradoxical. So, uh, and in this respect, I think is, uh, I mean, if in terms of what uh, not, and I, I don't think we should just um, ask what the Greek authorities are doing, because as I said, it's very important to um, understand the complex uh, political game going on with the European Commission and the pressure put by the European commissions on states like Spain, Italy, and Greece. Um, so uh, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's quite interesting to notice how refugees are kept in this paradoxical condition of um, being repeatedly dependent, right, on uh, humanitarian uh, actors, but at the same time, uh, not being, not being, I mean, they, not being in the condition to fully rely on them, right? Uh, because there is no, it's not because of humanitarian actors' fault, not at all. It's because they, they, they organ the organization themselves do not, in some cases, receive the permission to uh, give some concessions to, to asylum seekers, or there is not enough, uh, I mean, uh, humanitarian aid, right, that they can uh, provide. Infrastructures are not enough. Uh, so it's not only a matter of the people deployed in the camp to help refugees. So there is this economy of uh, so of depleting refugees, right? By keeping them in the state of protracted dependency, but also by criminalize every autonomous uh, attempt to build lives differently. Um, so, uh, I mean, the two, two academics that, I mean, in a, in a different context, um, uh, refer to, I mean, use this term of extracting more from less, uh, Brett Nielsen and Ned Rossiter, um, two scholars based in Australia, uh, to speak about how uh, states capitalize on um, uh, on people, um, in particular in people that are subjected to uh, 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 economy of dispossession, right? And for me, this formula is quite interesting to, um, to stress how, um, apart from uh, the money, right, that uh, high tech companies uh, make uh, installing this technology and selling this technology to the European Union or to UNHCR, uh, or by keeping people right in this state of protracted dependency, there is this like uh, attempt to keep them right in a, in a, in in not not necessarily in the camp because the Greek authorities do their best to invisibilize them and they hope that people find a way to live right. Uh, even if it, this is not what the European Union wants, but to uh, maintain them uh, until when they are there in this uh, uh, state of depletion, right? Uh, that is uh, like supported and is uh, the, uh, the signal of this infrastructural scarcity, right? So infrastructural scarcity necessarily leads to this uh, I mean, uh, feeling of being depleted, right? Uh, of being fixed there, even if not fully mobilized, uh, and de being dependent, but knowing that this dependence is not doesn't mean safety, because there are not there is not enough medical support, there is not enough um, legal guarantees, and disregarding of, uh, I mean, the willingness, of course, of for instance, of many lawyers to provide legal aid, because it's how the asylum system is structured at the moment that asylum seekers, for instance, on the island don't even have the time to prepare for the asylum interviews, right? It's not, 
only about, I mean, there are many, there's plenty of legal um, organization that provides legal aid, right? Um, so there is this uh, infrastructural scarcity that paradoxically is sustained also through the implementation of technology uh, that work in a very une uneven way, right? And most of the time do not work that produce this stance of depletion. So, and uh, to conclude, I think is, uh, I mean, it's important to analyze the mutual entanglements between carceral mechanism and technology of control. In particular, technologies in refugee camps strengthen modes of carcerality, not however, or at least not primarily through capillary surveillance, but through uneven and unpredictable checks um, of, on refugees and by shape, the, shaping the camp as a site where refugees are not allowed to build autonomous infrastructure of livability. So I think that is important also uh, to conclude, as I said, to grasp the ambivalence logic of unsafety that refugees themselves partly end up in interiorizing. So um, there is this official discourse by Greek authorities, the technologies will make refugees safer. We ask them and they feel safer, right? And in part, this is also true because many people are scared of going out, right? Even if they're allowed to, but at the same time, of course, uh, are feel that they, they are in a prison because they can be potentially constantly monitored, okay? So I think it's precisely by taking seriously this ambivalence that we can elaborate a critique of carceral mechanism in force also uh, through technology. And this requires, as I said, to reconceptualize control beyond surveillance and tracking by taking into account the old exercise by states and non-state actors over refugee lives that leads to this uh, depletion, right? Um, so, and, and as a last, as a last uh, sentence, I would say that um, shifting the focus from surveillance towards modes in which control over refugees uh, is an exercise, right? Uh, in different form, in a heterogeneous way, uh, means not, I mean, not seeing migration like a state and refusing to uh, um, uh, direct focus our research or our, our also humanitarian intervention, political intervention, precisely where uh, the same actors that keep these people in detention encourage us to look at. Okay, I will stop here.